Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Marta Lochman, thank you for your willingness to contribute to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Each of these interviews have started with us learning a little bit about who's being interviewed. So tell us about you. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Tim, for the invitation. My name is Marta Lochman. I am a candidate right now for Boulder County Commissioner. My background, I was working previously as a resiliency specialist for the city of Longmont doing a project that really feels very familiar and I think will come up in this conversation um, after the flood of 2013. Um, looking at barriers to access, I taught in St. Green Valley School District and I'm a single mom. I've raised two kids in, um, in our open enrollment uh, school district here in St. Green. So a variety of hats of my career has been in housing as a housing advocate over the last 20 years, really specifically um, supporting and creating access for monolingual Spanish speakers throughout our community throughout the Front Range and the state of Colorado. Thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, mm -hmm. You know I'm going to ask you three questions. The first of these questions uh, is in this context of an unprecedented you know, moment in history where we are distanced from one another uh, in ways that we've never experienced before uh, and with the, the uh, anxieties going, that are associated with this uh, pandemic. How are you getting yourself through this, this moment in history? Yeah, I think it's an important question. And I think one of the pieces that we've been talking about in community is really trying to allow people to be wherever they're at. Um, and that really seems like just from having conversations with folks online is um, this up and down that we're all going through that, you know, Today, I feel great. I feel like I can manage a schedule that I'm not sure what the schedule really is. And, and other days, um, especially for me as a parent, you know, it's really, um, you know, we have all these different layers of our life. And I feel like that's been a little exasperated because, um, you know, being a mother, having two kids that have gone to school online now, um, who are in two different universities, who have professors that are handling the online school in different ways. So how do I support each one of them? Um, and my own business who, uh, you know, I'm considered a central business, but with real restrictions that are coming out and continue to evolve and change like we're all um, dealing with. And so I think that piece of really one being very forgiving of ourselves, um, not questioning why we are um, having a hard time when we're having a hard time. Why are we exhausted? Why are we, you know, it feels there's a lot of buzz out there online, and I think that's something we need to be very cognizant of. The pressure to see a lot of the memes, I'm sure you have too, about, you know, um, what's the new skill that you're working on? Hey, why, not, why aren't you learning another language? Why aren't you doing, and I, in my house, I, you know, told my son, uh, somebody out there is probably cleaning the garage out, but I can guarantee you my garage will look the same after this, um, because that's just not where my head is right now. My head is, how do I help community? get through this and I know we're going to talk about that some but um, I think just trying to accept that every day really does feel different and learning how to manage that is for me a challenge. 
we are, uh, we've never experienced the isolation from friends and family members like we are experiencing now. How are you staying connected to the friends and family, important people in your life? Sure, and, and I wanna share a perspective um, that you may have already heard a little bit from other participants and maybe will, because for a lot of us, um, I have family that lives uh, in South America. And so this walk between two worlds is an experience that myself and my kids have felt for years. And it's very hard um, to go through a holiday without being part with your family. It's very hard to go through different situations in our lives and the way that technology works or doesn't work that sometimes you can't get a hold of a family member. Um, sometimes their technology isn't working. Um, and so, I share that because this piece of isolation for a lot of us is elevated now. Um, seeing what's happening in our home countries, seeing the significant gaps. I mean, the US is one issue. And then you look at the way that other countries around the world are also dealing with this pandemic. Um, and in some areas of the world, our family members, if infected, will not survive. So the isolation is um, on another level for us with family members outside of the US. And then we're also dealing with what you just talked about, the isolation of being in our day-to-day -day, um, lives. My life, um, because I'm involved in so many community activities, because you know, I'm currently, or, you know, was currently running a, a campaign where I was out talking with everybody. And what I finally realized, uh, you know, three weeks of being in my house, you know, last week it was kind of one of these moments of, I'm an extrovert. <laughs> I'm the one that's, that's always calling out, um, reaching out to friends, reaching out to you know, my comadres. Let's have brunch, let's have coffee. Hey, let's meet after work. And it took me a little while to realize that's why some of this has been very hard for me. So when you talk about that isolation, it's all these different levels. And I think that's again, part of trying to, um, you'll, you'll never understand my walk. You'll never understand how I'm feeling today the same way I won't ever understand how today is for you. But for us to be more cognizant and open to the idea of this situation feels different for somebody else than it may for me. And how can I be open to just supporting them? Not how I want to be supported, but how they might need to be supported. And how do I become a listener in a completely different way while we're being isolated? Well, yeah, lots of different levels <clears throat> for everybody, yeah. but especially you're obviously very clear on what those are for you. Um, it's faced, uh, the, the third question is based on the assumption that uh, the world on the other side of this pandemic is likely to be different than it was before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of discussion now about what the new normal will be. You know, we don't know what that's going to be, but we're going to settle into a new normal. So right now, the question for you is, what would you like to see as the new normal? What do you aspire to see and, and would you like to help create on the other side of this pandemic? Sure, yeah, that's a big one. That's a big question. And you know, I've been talking with folks in the sense of we really need to be cognizant that there won't be a new normal because that ties us into having things be the same as they were. And quite frankly, the previous way and the way that things have been set up before wasn't working for a lot of folks in our community. Um, and so for me, this is an opportunity for us to do business differently. It's an opportunity for us to really call out where the injustices are. It's an opportunity for us to truly put community members at the front of how we program, how we plan, how we lead, how we make decisions. And I've been talking about this for a while in general, um, about the fact that we keep talking about in communities, in the state, you know, obviously uh, nationwide about how we want to start addressing equity. And we have never lived in this country in an equitable world. We've never had an equitable to get to. And so to have this opportunity now to really start looking at how would we do that? It brings me back from, you know, my previous work, you know, being in the housing industry, 
being in the mortgage crisis, sitting with families who were dealing with foreclosure, who we were just trying to get to a foreclosure hotline for an example, um, who really were affected negatively by decisions made up at the top level in regards to housing um, kind of reactions to some of the, the mortgage crisis. And then also working with folks in the flood and seeing in both of those situations, sectors of our community, and it's, it's news today again, and, and the reality that people of color in this country, communities of color in this country, people without wealth in this country have been left out of systems and access to resources and programming and just information. And we see it time and time again, you know, every decade more or less. Um, and so this to me is the opportunity for us to force a change that will be better. And so for me, what does that mean? It means that I'll continue to do the same work that I've been doing um, for decades to try and bring people who don't have access to resources, to local government, to agencies, to institutions. Um, I also think it's a really good opportunity for folks to look at the reason why we're doing what we're doing. And, you know, there's a lot of talk right now around pivoting and what does that mean in our small, for our small businesses, for our businesses, for our institutions, and um, to really challenge us to look outside of the box because to, to go back now and look at the box that we've been using to make decisions is not going to support real change for this rebuild that we're gonna be doing town by town and city by city, county to the states and certainly in this country. Well, <clears throat> there's some challenges there. Yeah. And I know you're up to them. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, uh, and, and I know you're gonna bring a bunch of us along with you in, in response to those. So Marta, thank you. Uh, thank you so much again for lending your voice and your vision to this project. Take care of yourself and your family, and uh, we'll, our paths will cross again soon when we're able to, to move out of the state of home order and reconnect. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the work that you're doing. This is an important conversation for us to start and really think about as we move ahead. So great work. Thank you. Bye-bye. Agatha Moya, thank you so yes. much for lending your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. To get us started, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, sure, of course. So my name is Agatha Moya, and um, I, I'm originally from New Mexico. and I've lived in Colorado and, and Longmont for 45 years, I suppose. And um, I'd, uh, I've, well, I've been retired for two years. And I'm very happy to be immersed in my artwork right now. I'm an artist. And when I was uh, in my working life, I lived, I worked mostly as a um, case worker, social service um, uh, career. And yeah, I, I've been really doing a lot of my artwork. Let me think what else about me. Um, I'm married to my beautiful husband, David. I've got two children and I'm very anxious about them right now. Yeah. Um, they're grown. My son is a jewelry designer, a small business, and my daughter works for a nonprofit and they're both very anxious now. Um, is there anything else you want to know about me? That, that, just so we have an idea. <laughs> That's just very brief. So, someday when people are watching this, they'll have, they'll, they'll want to know who were you and and that kind of yeah. background that you bring to this. So you know I'm going to ask you three questions. Yeah. And the first of those questions is that in this uh, period of history where unprecedented for any of us, where we are physically distanced from one another and, and disconnected in a lot of ways, how are you getting yourself uh, through this period of time? Yeah. Uh, and probably like everyone else, I mean, just stay in really close contact with loved ones, you know, friends. Family, children, and uh, and trying to keep things in perspective. Uh, going for lots of walks, eating well, exercising—all those things. Um, 
And let's see, what else did I write down here? I wrote down all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Um, actually, I, I do, I'm spending more time out in nature and just doing more stargazing. And really, it helps me to keep things in perspective, to think that something bigger out there. Humanity has been through crises like this before. This is one. We're going to get through it. Um, and this is for my husband. He says, staying on, because this is for both of us. We both sat down and wrote down some answers. And he said, you know, staying on top of the news. And he likes to do that. For me, it's overwhelming. And after a while, I need to disconnect. But he <clears throat> wants to stay connected in that way. Um, and you know what? I mean, I guess just keep, keeping things in perspective, not to go into panic mode and to be smart about things, obviously. Follow the guidelines, you know, social distancing, social distancing, masks, everything. Don't, you know, don't take any risks. So given, um, given yeah. social distancing, I didn't yes. mean to cut you off. Did you have? No, that's you, fine. You're good. Uh, given social distancing and the physical separation and um, stay at home orders, uh, how are you keeping yourself connected to friends and family? Yeah, lots of phone calls, um, Zoom, which is, <laughs> you have to comb your hair to talk to somebody, right? <laughs> and, I don't. You know, uh, text, email, all of those things. Um, and then um, really, like with neighbors, you know, visiting across the way, you know, waving. And that's pretty much we're staying connected. All right. My third question, uh, as you know, uh, the presumption here of the, with the third question is that whatever lies on the other side of this pandemic and this isolation we're experiencing, whatever the new normal we settle into, whatever that becomes, life is likely to be different than it was before the pandemic. Yes. So it's not too early uh, for us to be thinking about what's our preferred future. What would you like to see on the other side of this pandemic? Yeah. Uh, what would you like to move toward? What would you like to help create as your preferred future? Oh, I like the way you said that. How, what would you like to help create? That's, that's poignant. I like that piece of it. Uh, and that, I'm sure it's big for everyone because we really need to think about what this is going to look like. And you're absolutely I think we're going to be different people. The world is going to be different. And I hope the way we see things are going to be different. Because that's crucial, the way we treat each other. So um, I wrote down, I guess I just wanted to say a little bit of how, what this has caused, I think. And I think for us, the planet, Mother Nature, really, I think in so many ways, has hit the reset button and has forced us to pause. It has paused its healing and it is forcing us to pause and rethink things. How, who we are in the world, how we are in the world, how we're treating each other, what we need, what things are important, what things are not, all of those things. So moving forward, I hope that people oh, come out of this seeing themselves differently how, again, how they are in the world, how they're treating people, um, how they need to think, do things differently. And, um, and really, really after taking stock of what's important, what isn't, that those relationships that they have are stronger and that they have a, I guess, a healthier perspective of where they are, the world around them, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I would just, I know, I guess I would like to think, and this is the part it, that you were talking about, uh, contributing to what you like is to build in community and being involved in community. And, you know, and, and I guess I was running about, you know, rising above the, the rhetoric and the anger and the narratives that are out there and really, being brave enough to say, you know, I want to do things differently. And I want to reach out to somebody who is different from me and really listen more and judge less and be more empathetic, more compassionate. And just, you know, I guess my anxiety is I hope that we don't forget. We don't forget this time because it is an opportunity to really stop and 
look and pay attention and that we don't go back to things the way they were. And I suppose moving forward too, I really thought about this, is that I hope we move further away from social media, to be honest, you know, Facebook and Twitter and even TV, turn it off for heaven's sakes. I mean, we need the peace and quiet. And this is one thing I'm really relishing about this time is a silence. I am enjoying it so much and enjoying those really deep, wonderful conversations. Um, I guess I know this is, I hate to get political, but the thing that I hope to experience is new leadership. Leadership, whatever that looks like. And I'm not talking Republican, Democrat. I'm talking about, oh, I don't know, somebody who's an adult who can think logically, understands the Constitution, the beauty of this unique country, all of those things that can take us to a, a, us as a country to a better place uh, that's not uh, so negative and so filled with anger. And that's what I'm hoping for. Agatha Moya, thank you yes. so much again for your contribution to this project. Yeah, thank you. Take care of yourself, your husband, your family, yeah. stay safe. And when we, can, when we can re-enter the world, um, I'll look forward <laughs> to our paths crossing again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for everything that you do. Thank you. Rich and Kay Marsh, thank you so much for lending your voices and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Each of these interviews, we've started by learning a little bit about who's being interviewed. So tell us about you. Hi, I'm Kay Marsh. Um, I'm the wife of Rich. Um, I'm a retired United Methodist minister, and now I'm working as a spiritual director with clients that see me online. So I don't even have to have an office anymore. I just have an online presence. I'm also working as uh, my husband's bookkeeper for the present. So that's what I'm about at this point. Rich? Uh, I am Rich Marsh. I am a lawyer here in Longmont uh, and uh, have an active practice, uh, less active right now than it was a month ago, but have an active practice um, in the business and real estate areas. So uh, uh, we also have two daughters, married, grown, and with their own uh, families. They're healthy. We're glad for that. Well, in this uh, you know, I'm going to ask you three questions and I'm going to preface it with in this uh, unprecedented moment in human history, uh, uh, the kind of distancing, physical distancing and physical separation and social distancing we're all experiencing. Uh, everybody's trying to figure out how to kind of get through and, and, and get through in, in one piece as an individual, as a family. How are you working your way through? How are you getting through this crisis? Um, so on the work side, um, I was doing a lot of Zoom and similar platform meetings even before this, uh, but those have intensified. Um, I had still on the uh, law practice side, I represent some organizations and businesses that uh, have had some unique challenges put before them with payroll, with uh, meetings, with uh, insurance claims, uh, which, which has been interesting over the last month, five, six weeks. Um, uh, I am pretty good with two thirds of the order, the order being work at home. Um, I'm pretty good now with the at home part. The work is uh, working at home it has required some adjustments. Um, and uh, on the personal level, uh, we find ourselves uh, looking for great series, you know, uh, premium channel series to, to binge. And, uh, we are, if we're not experts at that, we're, we're really, really good. <laughs> yeah, you want to add to that? Sure. Um, what I've done is, as, you, as I've already said, my spiritual direction practice, which is sort of pastoral counseling, is mostly online, is all online now anyway. And so this, is, this continues. Yesterday I had three, uh, uh, three meetings online. Okay, and it was, it's really good. It's, it's a good way to go about it. And I did that before the crisis and now I'm just doing it in the crisis. We also have set me up with, a, with 
QuickBooks on my computer and that's you know channeled into Rich's office. So now I can actually do this at home. I can do I can do his books at home. The other thing that we I've done is be in touch with a, a variety of people doing welfare checks of them, um, our next door neighbors, um, the uh, a couple of uh, elected officials have asked me and others to do welfare checks of their constituents, and I'm very happy to do that. As a pastor, that's that's just right up my alley. Um, and then we have been staining the fence, the brand new fence, and that takes more time and effort than anyone would know. Although today it's last couple of days it's been snowy, so we're not staining a fence, but uh, we've we've been keeping uh, quite busy. I this is just a wrinkle of uh, what I usually do, sort of a wrinkle in my usual routine now that I have not, not that I'm not working full time. Well, some of the response to this question segues nicely into question number two, and that is how are you staying connected to family and friends during this time of unprecedented isolation? Um, uh, Mainly email and phone calls with family um, uh, and friends. Uh, there are Zoom meetings or Vimeo or or Skype or FaceTime, um, um, but mainly phone calls. More phone calls with our wider family members. I have a brother and a sister, um, and I've you know been in touch with them more than I would have been before. I'll let Kay speak to her siblings. Uh, so that's been good. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, family is our immediate nuclear family uh, is healthy. In fact, one of our daughters in the Seattle area was tested uh, last week or recently, and she tested negative for the uh, virus. So that's, uh, those are, <laughs> it's just, you know, <laughs> you, yeah. we would normally be calling once every other week, maybe, or maybe once a week. And, and now we're in touch much more frequently. Mm -hmm. Question number three in this interview. Oh, wait, let, let oh, Kay talk. Sorry, Kay. <laughs> it's okay, on too Kay. quickly. It's okay. Quickly, um, I'm in touch with, just like Rich, my siblings. I'm talking to them more often than I'm used to and that they're used to, but it just seems fine. And as I said, um, I'm, I'm doing well welfare checks of my neighbors, <laughs> my little old lady neighbors, and they're very lovely people. So I'm, I'm, just we're just oh and i'm more in touch with my husband now that he's home <laughs> this is amazing uh, that, those can be good things or bad things i guess it's all good <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. All good. <laughs> yeah that is good and i'm not surprised uh so the third question here is uh and the assumption underlying the third question is that whatever was normal before this pandemic the new normal is going to be different life won't be the same on the other side of this crisis so it's not too early to be thinking about what your preferred future is. What would you like to see? What would you like the new normal to be? And what are you interested in helping to create as a new normal on the other side of this crisis? On the other side of this crisis, I would like to see universal health care, because when one is sick, whether they have health insurance or not, they're going to get, they will pass whatever it is on to everybody else, health insurance or not. And that's terribly important. Um, and so I'd like to, I'd also like to see medical advances as a result of all of this. Um, one of the things that I, that is on my mind as I go, we go through this is that I'm a survivor of the 1957 pandemic of Asian flu. I contracted it when I went to kindergarten. I had very high fevers. I still, re I still unfortunately remember the hallucinations I had at five years old when I had this um, Asian flu, and I passed it on to my mother. She got sick, got uh, pneumonia, and died. So this is, this kind of pandemic stuff is very, oh, it's closer to home to me than I like to think about. So, and as a result of that 1957 pandemic, they, they took some looks at how they were doing medical things and how they were, they didn't quarantine, and I'm sure that has affected us today. I'm hopeful for the future for universal health care now. Yeah. Rich? Um, I'm fairly pessimistic about what's coming out of this. Uh, before the pandemic, um, I was 
uh, actively involved with groups and people uh, seeking uh, normalcy uh, in a pre-2016 sense and, and have watched um, our institutions, our processes, our expectations of public behavior by our elected officials uh, be degraded and abused and abased. And so uh, it wasn't normal before the pandemic. And uh, I, I, through this election cycle, don't see it getting anywhere close to normal again. Um, I, I, uh, uh, and so I am committed to uh, continuing or resuming uh, with that same uh, fight, uh, if I guess I can call it that, with that same effort uh, as we move toward this, this November's election. Um, and I'm afraid I'm fairly uh, focused on that and it's hard to see beyond. <laughs> Well, but there's a focus, and there is a there is a beyond out there, and uh, we'll encounter encounter it together. Uh, I want to say again how grateful I am that you've contributed to this project. Uh, I want you to uh, to to stay safe, take care of your family, and when we can come back outside, our paths will cross again in the big room. Thanks. And and Janie too. Thanks, Tim. Richard Garcia. Thank you so much for lending your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. We've started each of these interviews with um, learning a little bit about the interviewee. So let's start by learning about Richard Garcia. Who are, who are you? Tell us about you. Well, first of all, let me thank you, um, Tim, for, for doing this. I think it means a lot to all different segments of the community. But uh, I'm going to try and be as brief as I can my, uh, with my background information. First, I want to make sure that people, uh, and people may not know this, but I was born in Montevista, Colorado, which is in the San Luis Valley, one of the most beautiful valleys in the United States and also in the world, for that matter. Uh, and, and it's a very poor valley. Uh, the uh, major industry in the San Luis Valley is farming. Uh, and uh, most of the farming is potatoes. Uh, and it's considered to be second to Idaho as it relates to uh, the growing of potatoes. Um, when I was growing up in the San Luis Valley, you didn't have a lot of automation. A lot of the, the farm work you had to do by hand. And I can recall uh, in my earlier years, as I was growing up, probably around nine, 10 years old, that's when I was put to do farm work, picking potatoes. And that is hard work, man. You know, and, uh, but anyway, uh, and then uh, moving forward a little bit quicker, um, my mother was a single head of household, and uh, uh, she worked the potato producing uh, 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 industry, you know, where they sacked the potatoes and they washed them and all that and they shipped them out to places like King Super, Safeways, etc. Uh, so she was doing that kind of work and, and it was hard work and it didn't pay a whole lot, you know, and she was the breadwinner. So frequently we had to go into public assistance and get uh, food stamps or, or even, uh, and in those days it was not uh, TANF, it was AFDC, uh, aid, aid to families with, uh, what is it, AFDC? For dependent children? Dependent children, there yeah. you go. Yeah, and uh, so, so we were on welfare. Uh, part of my time we were growing up. Uh, and, then, and then she contracted cancer. Um, I think she might have been, I'm gonna say 34, 35 when she got cancer. And I was already like about mm, maybe 14 years old. Uh, so she got us all together. She huddled us all in and one because our, our, our living quarters were three rooms. Okay, you had the kitchen, uh, you had uh, and two bedrooms. One of the bedrooms had a, an oil uh, uh, heater, you know, that you heated up the room with with uh, with with oil and uh, uh, kerosene oil and. Uh, uh, and that's where you took baths and all that stuff, okay. Uh, so she huddled us in, in that middle room and she said, 
she told us the news, you know, and we didn't know anything about cancer, you know. We thought it was exciting that we were going to move to Denver, you know, and uh, so we moved to Denver, and 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 the reason she had to move to we had to move to Denver is because the hospitals in in uh, the San Luis Valley were not equipped to deal with cancer, and neither were the hospitals in Denver. I mean, uh, you're talking about the '50s, uh, and the only thing they knew how to do was to operate, cut, operate, and all of that. Like they tried to get cancer stuff out. I don't believe there was anything such as chemotherapy or any of that stuff that were available at that time. There might have been, but I can't remember. Uh, so anyway, she passed away uh, oh about a year after we moved to Denver, uh, and then the family, my grandmother, took us over and, and we moved back to Monte Vista. At that time, I was already what so maybe sixteen, going on seventeen. Uh, and uh, I started working in the warehouses where she was working at when I got back home because we didn't have uh, any income except for the income that I was able to provide. And then my, mo my grandmother, then she got AFDC too, you know, to provide for us. Uh, so uh, that, um, when I turned 17, the first thing I did was I joined the Navy. Uh, only because I had to get out of the valley and then I needed to find a way to continue supporting my, 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 my uh, brothers and sisters and my grandmother. So half of my measly little paycheck that I was getting in the Navy was given to her. Okay, so if you, if you can figure around those days, it was like about maybe 45 bucks every two weeks or something like that. But I was only getting like about $20 every two weeks, you know. So I was, I was my, my paycheck was cut in half. Uh, so that went on for four years. Then I got out of the Navy um, and uh, uh, got to Denver uh, and started dating my um, uh, girlfriend, my childhood girlfriend again, and got married. You know, uh, I was what, maybe 20, going on 21 when I got married. I wasn't 21 quite yet. So when I got married, I had to. Uh, get permission to get married because I was still a minor. My wife, uh, my first wife, she didn't have to get permission because she was a little bit younger than I was, but her age for, for being able to be on her own was 18 and guys had to be 21. Okay. So anyway, we got married. Ah, going on, I had four children, um, went back to live in Denver, got jobs, etc. you know, and uh, then I got this opportunity to come and study at the University of Colorado. Uh, through the educational opportunity programs. So I did that. Uh, but before I did that, I had to go get my GED because I didn't have that. And I went and got my GED without studying. I just took the test and boom, passed it. Uh, and began uh, my career at the University of Colorado. Uh, I got a degree in four years. Four years. I went in 1970, graduated in 1974. Uh, and I say four years because normally it takes about six years now for kids to get out of school when they get to higher ed. Uh, so I got my degree in four years and I, uh, my, my major was political science. So that's when all of this craziness started happening with me and my, my career and all of that. My first thing was to go to law school, but then I started, I had kids in school, so I got involved very much in, in the education of my kids. So everything shifted to education. Um, went on and got my master's degree in education got a type D certificate, teaching certificate, all of that stuff. Okay, just to give you just a little bit of background. And here we are now. Okay. I got two families, my first family with uh, my first wife, and then my second family that I've been married now with Teresa Teresa Garcia, going on 40 years. Okay, so you can, <laughs> and I got a child that's going to turn 40 here pretty quick. <laughs> my other child, Lorena Garcia, who is turning 38, April 21st, and she's running for the United States Senate. Yes, she is. Yeah. So, you know, the other day I told him, I says, you know, I'm really proud of you all because who would have thought that a poor guy from very humble beginnings, high school dropout, could have such a gifted family like I have, you know? But anyway. I would so that's say <laughs> good, good genes flowing through that family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so after that, then I started getting involved a lot more in a lot of other things and, and was, have been appointed to a bunch of different committees. Uh, currently, I am on the state board of uh, 
trustees for the community college system on the school board for Boulder Valley School District. That's an elected position. The, the, the state board trustee is uh, an appointed position. I was appointed by Governor Polis. Uh, and then prior to that, I was serving on the, what they call the P preschool 20 council appointed by um, the uh, Governor Ritter the first time and then Governor Hickenlooper the second time. And then I was also on the Commission on Higher Education appointed by Governor Owens. So, you know, so my, my first contact with governors was, with, was actually with Governor Romer. Governor Romer started looking at, way back in I think 86, he was looking at the summer of violence and he created uh, a task force called the Fatherhood Task Force. And he appointed me to serve on that Fatherhood Task Force. So I've got all these different experiences and all of that, you know, and, and uh, one of the things that I'm really, really proud of is by, uh, being the founder of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition and working that coalition for 30, 80 years, finally retiring from that coalition, from that nonprofit, uh, but working much more around engaging and involving families in education of their children especially Latino families, because there's a big gap there. Anyway, shoot. All right. That's a, a biogra biographical sketch of, of Richard Garcia. You know I'm going to ask three questions. Okay. The first of these questions is, in this time of, uh, of social isolation and physical distancing that, that none of us, at least in our lifetimes, have ever experienced, how are you getting through this, this time of, of isolation? Personally, myself? Yes, yeah. Um, well, fortunately, I do have a partner, okay? And we're both isolated, we're both in the same household. Uh, fortunately, uh, we both do the same work, uh, uh, trying to help other families. Uh, fortunately, I have the means to be able to have a computer. Uh, I have the means to be able to uh, uh, get online and have Zoom conversations, etc. So, and then I have two dogs and we go on walks frequently, my two little guys. And, uh, and then I have a wonderful neighbor that sweeps my sidewalk that he was doing it a while ago. But, but yeah, uh, I think being isolated, but having someone to be isolated with, I think is really, really helpful. I can't imagine having to be isolated by myself, you know, without having anyone to talk to or pets or someone, you know, to, to be able to at least occupy my time with. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, at least dogs in American households are probably losing a lot of weight these days because they're being walked a lot more than they might have been in, in, in the past months or years. Yeah, yeah, I usually take my dogs out twice a day. Yeah. yeah. Richard, uh, you, you pro you've already uh, kind of segued into my second question, and that is, how are you staying connected with family and friends? Since we can't be together physically, how are you staying connected at least emotionally and, and virtually? Well, it's usually virtually um, or by telephone. Uh, but I have a couple of very, very, t not a couple, I've got a lot of talented kids, uh, and they've created family Zoom um, meetings that we have where not just the, the kids get together, but the kids' kids, the grandkids, and frequently the great grandkids. Can you imagine trying to get 40 people on a Zoom meeting? And that means your, your own children, your children's children, my grandkids, and then my grandkids already have children of their own, great grandkids. You know, and, and, and we do that. We manage to do that. Not all of them participate, but many of them do. And we can stay on that Zoom, uh, I mean, easily an hour. And it goes by fast, you know, where everybody's talking and, and all of that. And just now, we're planning a birthday party for all the kids that were born in May, April. Uh, and it's going to be a Zoom birthday party. And we're also planning on having virtual karaoke. <laughs> but, you know, I just sent them a, a text. I says, 
someone's going to have to take the lead on that because if not, we're all going to be over singing. <laughs> over. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, uh, that's one way to keep in touch with the family. And, uh, uh, and, and, and again, because I have the means to be able to do that. Uh, I thank the lucky stars. I thank the creator for allowing me to have those means. Yeah. But on the other hand, I know families that don't have it and are in isolation. I mean, totally complete isolation. Richard, on the other side of uh, the pandemic and the, our, our kind of stay at home order, uh, it's, it's fair to assume, I believe, that whatever the new normal is, life is gonna be different once we come out of this pandemic than it was before we went in. And what that new normal is, is yet to be determined. So the last question in this interview is, what would you like to see? What's your preferred future? What would, like, what would you prefer to see on the other side of this? And, and, and what's the future you're willing to help create? Well, I think we're learning a lot through this pandemic. I think uh, uh, good and bad. Um, I think, for, by, by and large, I think all, most of it has been good uh, as it relates to how we treat each other, how we interact with each other. I see a lot more respect across the board uh, as it relates to even taking a walk with your dogs and you see somebody walking, you're at least saying hi or waving. Um, even though you have to maintain your distance. Uh, my next door neighbor, Randy, he uh, was out the other day doing his yard and I was coming from the, uh, the uh, post office, little boxes that we have in our neighborhood. And, uh, and I had, 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 I had his mail. So I handed his mail to him because it was put in my box by mistake. And then we started talking. And what really struck me at that time is that I think I talked to him more now through this crisis that we have than I had before. I'm getting to know him better now than I had before. I'm getting to know my neighbors better now. And then the other thing that strikes me very positive is when I look outside, and I look at the skies, I look at the mountains, you can see them. Beautiful, beautiful mountains, a beautiful blue sky, no pollution, none of that stuff. And I'm hoping that on the other side of this pandemic, that we continue some of these particular practices. We don't have to be driving our automobiles as much as we, and we know that, we know that now, uh, I think there's a lot of people that can still continue working at home and not have to go to an office. I mean, after this, they probably don't want to do that anymore, but, but I'm hoping that maybe some of this uh, forced practices will stick with us um, for those that can. Now, on the other side of all of this, you have people that are not as fortunate. Uh, you have people that, um, well, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real open here because I think it, I would be remiss if I didn't say this, that the work that my wife and I do is with the immigrant community, the Latino immigrants in Boulder County. And we know that many of those particular families, at least for the adults, for the parents, the kids are all U.S. born citizens, but the adults are still undocumented. And we're finding now through this pandemic that uh, many are not able to uh, qualify for unemployment benefits uh, because they're undocumented. Many uh, cannot um, get the benefit of the stimulus packages that are being passed in Washington. Uh, they're 
unemployed, they don't have any revenue coming into their homes, and they are devastated. Um, and we do have, thank God, a lot of good nonprofits in this community that are trying to do whatever they can to support these particular families. Uh, but that only goes so far. We manage through the Engaged Latino Parents Advancing Student Outcomes in Paso through a couple of wonderful donors to be able to provide rental assistance to the El Paso families for the month of April. Now, month of May, who knows? You know, because uh, our families need the rental assistance, not not a $200 stipend to, you know, because they need the full rental assistance. And, and many of them are, their rents are like $1,500 a month. Some are even paying as much as $2,000 a month. Where are they going to get that? You know, so anyway, uh, so that's the bad side of it. Uh, and I'm hoping that after all this is said and done, that may be on the other side of the pandemic. And who knows how long that's going to take. It's probably going to November, some people are predicting. Uh, but then we'll have another election. And I don't want to get political here at all. We'll have another election. And maybe after that, we'll have enough political will to be able to do some really good comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform so that these families are not suffering like this anymore. Well, Richard, uh, that is a noble aspiration, and I can I can assure you that you are, among others, uh, with those kinds of aspirations for a new normal on the other side of this pandemic. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your con contribution to this project. Take care of yourself and your family, uh, all those generations of Garcias. Be safe, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and you too. You be safe, and... Uh... Wear your mask when you go out. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Talk to you soon.